Have you ever had to stand absolutely still before? I mean, not moving a single muscle for fear that it might cost you your life. Standing there looking over at Brian, his arms and legs are locked in place, and I can see sweat dripping from his forehead onto his clothing. The fear in his eyes mimic mine perfectly. The scent of blood has been permeating the air with each passing second. Shifting my eyes downward, I could see Alice, her tearful yet lifeless eyes staring back at me. Her arm is outstretched towards my leg, though it has been some time since it last moved. Looking beyond Brian, I can see the outline of Billy's body in the darkness near the trees. He tried to make a run for it, and only made it a handful of steps. Natalie is sitting near one of the tents. Her cheeks are stained with tears, though she has been doing well to stifle her sobs. She keeps looking at me and Brian for help, but we are unable to offer her any. I can feel warm breath coating the back of my neck. The scent is horrid, like weak old garbage that had been left to rot in a storm drain. The smoke from the campfire isn't helping much either just mixing with the scent of blood and breath, swirling together into a foul putridness. I can feel its presence standing mere inches behind me. Despite its appearance, the subtlety in which it moves is startling. You would have no idea it was creeping up behind you, until it was too late. Although the present danger is consuming most of my thought process at the moment, I can't help but think back to when this all started. Three days ago, I was sitting in my living room relaxing after a taxing day at work, my rumbling stomach begging me to order food. As I was browsing through the multiple food listing apps, my phone suddenly began to buzz. The alert startled me for a moment until I realized who was calling me. It was the only person who ever calls me, and it's probably the only person on earth who calls anyone anymore. It was Billy, and the moment I pressed the accept call button on my phone, which in hindsight I shouldn't have, Billy exploded through my speaker. Gee, what's up man, what you got going on? He shouted. I rubbed my eyes and held the phone a few inches away from my ear. Not much Billy, what are you doing? Just getting some people together to hang out at the lake. Oh, that sounds fun. Well, hope you have a good time. Come on, T, don't be like that. I need you to come out here with us. It'll be fun. This didn't sound super appealing to me to begin with, so I just tried to brush him off. However, Billy was quite persistent. After nearly 20 minutes of badgering and discussing the terms of the trip, I could quite literally feel myself cave in like a crumpled tin can. He explained that it was only going to be a handful of people going to the lake this upcoming weekend. He said he desperately needed a break from the monotony of everyday life. He also reminded me a few times that he showed up as a wingman for me on more than one occasion. After being verbally beaten down and guilt tripped into a corner, I agreed. The weekend arrived and before I knew it I was standing outside on my front porch with a backpack in hand. Billy's loud jeep rattled up my driveway and in a grand gesture he stood up and asked what I was waiting for. Billy is a lot to handle at times but he means well and for the most part is a generally good guy. He just likes to take things up a notch. I tossed my bag in the back and crawled into the back seat next to the girls. I knew Alice from high school, though I'm sure during those days she probably didn't realize I even existed. This was my first time meeting Natalie on the other hand. We all shared introductions and I tried my best not to crowd them, despite the narrow seating arrangement. Brian was another guy whom I knew from high school but he didn't stand out much. He was a large, quiet, and soft-spoken guy if memory served as we hadn't really interacted much. Honestly, it was quite surprising to see him in the passenger seat next to Billy, who was so loud and boisterous. 
We spent the next several hours listening to Billy rattle off stories from his past. Alice and Brian just spent a good portion of it on their phones. Meanwhile, Natalie and I just stared out of the windows, basically drifting off into our own little worlds. It wasn't long until we were turning off the main stretch of road and onto the rocky path through the trees. The path, despite its roughness, was surprisingly straight. It continued inward for a few miles until it spilled out into a parking area. We parked the jeep and disembarked. Billy tossed me one of the tents while he and Brian carried the other things. A weathered wooden sign near a footpath signified a camping area ahead. Billy gestured for us to follow him as he marched onward. The camping area wasn't exactly what I had expected. I thought it would be this great large clearing that multiple people could use simultaneously, but the area was barely large enough for just us. I passively brought it up to Billy who just said that there were other camping sites dotted throughout the area like this. The girls helped set up camp while Billy and I scavenged firewood from nearby. I jokingly asked him where the lake was, and Billy just pointed off in a random direction. He said that the lake was a bit further inward, but that it was difficult to camp there due to the lack of space from the trees to the water. As we were picking up the various twigs and branches, I thought I heard something shuffling in the brush nearby. I looked over in the direction of the noise, but I saw nothing but plants. Billy tossed a twig at me and told me to quit daydreaming. We started the fire and just before sun began to set, we pulled out some foldable chairs while Billy handed out beer and snacks. Truth be told, this was actually really nice. I was having a surprisingly good time. We were all laughing together and sharing jokes. Billy was reiterating stories from the car ride up here but we didn't mind. Even Brian chimed in with a story or two. While we all enjoyed each other's company, I absentmindedly gazed around the campsite. The flickering light from the fire bounced off the tree trunks and branches, casting long, jagged shadows all around us. My eyes drifted from shadow to tree, shadow to tree. And then my eyes stopped. There was a face, peeking out from between two trees. The light ebbed and flowed, causing the face to appear and disappear at regular intervals. It was difficult to see what it was, but it clearly wasn't a part of nature. Plus, it seemed to be hovering in the darkness. I told everyone to quiet down and they all turned to me with confused expressions. I calmly asked what that was as I pointed in the direction of the trees. All in unison, everyone turned their attention onto the dark wall of trees. There was a collection of audible gasps, and both Billy and Brian stood from their seats. This caused Alice and I to stand as well. Natalie remained seated near one of the tents but kept her eyes trained on the face in the distance. We all watched as this thing began to move out of the trees closer into the light. Its body was jet black, like it had pulled the darkness from the woods and wore it like a skin. Its neck and limbs extended far beyond that of a normal person. Its torso was relatively small in comparison to its appendages. Despite its blackened appearance, I could see the outline of its ribcage. It looked extremely emaciated, like it hadn't eaten in years. It took one exaggerated step after another, and when each foot struck the ground, I heard nothing but silence. It held out two spindly arms in front of its body, almost like a T-Rex. It would have been somewhat funny if I wasn't so terrified. Its fingers were thin like needles, and they stretched nearly a foot from the hand itself. Alice shrieked and spun to run away. In a flash, I watched the creature snap its attention onto her and close the distance to her in milliseconds. She held up an arm to shield herself from its advance, and with one swift motion, it brought its sharp fingers down, severing her arm in two. She cried out once more, 
and the creature punctured her chest with all five needle-like fingers. She collapsed onto the ground, reaching out for me. Billy shouted and began running away from the camp towards the woods. Brian, who was right next to me, was about to turn and follow suit, but something forced me to reach out and grab him by the arm. The creature twisted its face towards Billy, and in the blink of an eye, all we heard was Billy's body impact the dirt. Natalie was frozen in place. Her eyes glanced up at me and I just mouthed, shh, back to her. I could tell she was biting her lips to keep her from weeping. Feeling the breath pass over the nape of my neck, I shut my eyes hoping this nightmare would end. Then, I heard the sound of dirt and gravel being disturbed. I cracked open an eye and saw the lifeless face of Alice being dragged away from the fire into the woods. After a few moments, both Alice and the creature disappeared into the trees. I turned to Brian and Natalie. I whispered for them not to move a muscle. I then turned and crept my way over to Billy, as slow as humanly possible. It took me nearly ten minutes to make it over to him, and he wasn't even that far away. Standing over him, I felt sick. His head was missing. I felt tears trying to force their way out of my eyes. I slowly reached down and fished his car keys from his pocket. As I stood back up and turned back to Brian and Natalie, I was face to face with the creature. I wanted to scream harder than I ever had before, but I just froze, biting down on the inside of my cheek so I wouldn't scream. I could taste the metallic liquid pooling in the back of my mouth. The creature was looking at me with hollow eyes, and for a few seconds I thought I'd share Billy's fate. Then, a moment later, it reached down, grabbed Billy's leg, and began dragging him off into the woods. I waited for a few seconds for the rustling of leaves to grow faint before slowly making my way back to the camp. I motioned for Brian and Natalie to follow me and one by one, we crept back down the path, leaving everything behind. We found Billy's Jeep and as soon as I started the engine, I vomited outside of the window. Natalie broke down in tears and Brian was as pale as a ghost. We drove out of there and back onto the main road. I parked on the side of the road and asked Natalie if I could borrow her phone as I had left mine in the tent. She handed it to me and I shakily called the police. I told them that a wild animal had attacked our camp and had dragged our friends into the woods. We sat in the car for 45 minutes before the sheriffs arrived. I felt absolutely disgusted lying about what we had witnessed, but it's not like I could have said, yes, a giant monster with needle fingers murdered our friends and dragged them into the woods. I explained to the sheriff that it was dark and we think it was a bear or a cougar. After standing on the road for nearly five hours, the sun began to rise. The sheriff scoured our campsite and found nothing but two pools of blood. They even followed the blood into the woods, but couldn't discern the location of our friends. We contacted their family shortly after that. They were devastated. I held Billy's mother's hand for hours. I don't think she'll ever be the same after this. I don't think any of us will ever be the same after this. I've been trying my best to get through this traumatic event. But yesterday, as I was sitting in my living room flipping through the TV, I came across a news report. They were talking about a campsite up near the lake saying that a string of campers have started to go missing lately and that they'll be shutting the area down until further notice.